à la conférencière suivante. Donc, euh, j'appelle euh, Re Rebecca Pledger, euh, qui, est donc, euh, qui a un PhD en, en chimie de l'université de Turin et euh, qui a euh, fait son postdoc euh, en collaboration avec la fondation euh, des musées de Turin, l'université de Turin, euh, des conservateurs et euh, le département de recherche scientifique de la National Gallery of Art de Washington. Et ces, euh, ces travaux donc, euh, sont sur euh, euh, l'étude de la stabilité et de la dégradation des, euh, des matériaux synthétiques modernes utilisés par les artistes et euh, les conservateurs. Et euh, elle va nous parler donc de, des matériaux qui sont utilisés pour la conservation des euh, objets peints. All right. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. I'm going to try to summarize some of the work that's being done on Biva 371. It's part of my fellowship, or the fellowship that just finished right now at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. I finished about two or three weeks ago. Uh, during the time, I was also a guest researcher at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Gaithersburg, Maryland, so just outside of Washington. Um, and the majority of the results that I'm going to present here is um, a combination of work done at both institutions. And on that note, I first want to acknowledge uh, that this is a really large international collaboration and without the help and input from all the different participants, uh, this project wouldn't be where it is today. Um, it has really been a group effort, um, which I hope will continue into the future. Now, the project was really the brainchild of Renee, who's out there somewhere, and Chris McGlinchey. Uh, I guess discussions about it started about four years ago. Uh, and they identified a gap in the literature concerning adhesives and consolidants. And the idea was to look at adhesives, um, the adhesives that were currently available, and to develop something new, but also to focus on something specific for the front of a painting, so a consolidant versus you know, a lining adhesive. So the goals uh, of the project were to first understand what properties are required for a successful consolidating adhesive for paintings and polychrome objects. And we decided to look at painting, painted layers first uh, to keep us kind of focused at the start. Uh, but it doesn't, um, of course, it doesn't exclude potential applications to um, other types of objects and materials in the future. Then this was all done for the overall goal and objective, which was to develop something completely new, a new consolidating adhesive. A uh, critical first step was to uh, study a model system. And this brings us right back up to the first point, which was understanding what properties are desirable for a consolidant. And, um, we decided to look at Biva 371 solution. It's unique among uh, conservation adhesives in that it's a multi-component mixture. It was specifically designed for the cultural heritage field, unlike many other synthetic consolidants and adhesives, which are usually single components and borrowed from industry or other applications. So we approached uh, the project in three steps. The first, uh, and this is what I'll focus on today in the talk, is looking at Biva 371 as a whole and dissected into its individual components to understand how everything ages and degrades. We also looked at how the components interact with each other in order to achieve the final performance properties. Um, and this was a very long and complicated step, as we discovered as we started to plow into it. And through lots of patience and hard work, we learned many interesting things uh, which are very helpful um, when using Biba 371, but also um, uh, in, important for the development of alternative Biva-like formulations and also brand new adhesives. Uh, and uh, this is important for the next two steps, which um, are here, but unfortunately I don't have very much time today uh, to go in into all the details of the, the research looking uh, at these. Um, uh, alternative formulations. Uh, I'll just say that we are discovering and learning many interesting things about how all the different components act together, uh, and this is really helping us uh, in the development of the new adhesive. 
So when investigating and designing consolidants, we thought of the application more for local treatments um, or for minimal intervention. I know some of, uh, in some early literature, um, at least the, the creator of Biva often described um, his treatments as like a more, a full treatment, a full uh, impregnation of the painting. Here we're looking at something um, very minimal. Um, and here are a few cases where a conservator uh, may want to use a consolidant. And yesterday we saw how humidity can cause stresses in paintings and compromise the paint layers. And along with these mechanical issues, we also have a lot of chemical issues. Uh, so here we can see um, we have delamination, um, cracking, friable paint layers, and also accidental damages like cuts and tears. And how is Biva 371 applied as a consolidant? Well, it's carried and delivered in a heated solvent, and this helps it get into the painting wick down below the paint layers. And at that point, it's left to dry. Um, and this is the, the simple solvent evaporation. Uh, conservators at this point can leave it, or they often do a, a, a heat activation step, and they use some sort of hot air tool or a tacking iron in order to do this. Now, the recommended heat activation temperature uh, for Biva 371 is 65 degrees Celsius. And at this point, it's still a tacky solid. But also, in theory, you can lower this temperature by adding a little bit of solvent to it. So why did we choose Biva 371 as our model system? Well, first, it's a very popular uh, consolidant. It's one of the most widely used consolidants around the world. Uh, or synthetic consolidants used around the world. It, you know, conservators tend to like it because it dries matte, it can fill gaps, it sticks to everything and also remains flexible over time. Uh, it can also be heated multiple times, so you can adjust and change uh, restoration if it's necessary. You can also modify the viscosity using heat and solvents, and this will help you um, change the degree of penetration into your painting and paint films. Now, it was originally designed as a heat seal lining adhesive, and this was by Gustav Berger in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Um, and he really carefully scrutinized it for this sort of application. So if you read his papers, you'll see that he did a lot of kind of mechanical testing and uh, peel testing, just more for lining applications. And there's not very much information um, looking at it as a consolidant, so something on the front of the painting. We don't see very much stuff in terms of its chemical stability and optical stability. Now, also about um, four years ago, there was a formulation change. Um, we learned about this through communication from the manufacturer. And if anyone has seen Nubiva, you also learned about it visually. Uh, one of the components was discontinued by the, its chemical manufacturer, so they're forced to find an alternative. Uh, also, going through the literature, there's a number of complaints that are uh, listed by conservators, also by speaking with conservators. So one of the main ones is that the new formulation doesn't stick like the original one. And also there's a lot of concerns about the long-term chemical stability, so yellowing, changes in solubility, and separation um, of all the different components. And so in a way, Biva was kind of a low-hanging fruit. And after the formulation change, it gave us a unique opportunity to compare the old and new formulations and to see what conservators liked and disliked about both of them. Um, and so during our investigations, we were able to address the concerns. And this is what I'll be talking about in the next few moments. And when we started, we thought it was going to be a nice straight path to success and said it was a very long and winding road. And we're still kind of going around the last bend, but we're at a very good point right now. So um, Biva it has a very typical hot melt formulation, except it's carried in a solvent. And as I mentioned, that's to help with the delivery into the paint layers. So it's better described as a heat seal adhesive. So hot melt has three principal components. Uh, there's your polymer, your tackifier, and your wax. And also there's a fourth, which are the stabilizers, which are there at a much lower concentration. Uh, and here I've listed the uh, formulation, the Biva formulation, um, that was published by Gustav Berger in 1972. So we have two 
Um, let's see if this actually works. Mm, no. Okay. So we have two um, polymers that make up the polymer base. They're both the, the same class. They're two polyethylene vinyl acetates, or EVAs, which is probably what I'll be calling them for the rest of the talk. Uh, they differ in their vinyl acetate content. So one has about 32% vinyl acetate, the other one only about 13. Then we have two tachifiers. We have the principal one, which is a ketone resin, on Larapol K80. And we have a secondary one that acts more like a plasticizer, which is cellulin 21. Finally, we have our wax, which is paraffin, uh, which is also a kind of a somewhat um, steep or it has a dramatic melting point around 65 degrees Celsius, very specific melting, uh, which is also similar to the main EVA, the LVAX 150. And finally, this is all carried in a solvent mixture, which is a combination of aliphatics and aromatics. And again, as I mentioned before, there was a formulation change. Uh, Larapol K80 was discontinued by BASF, and the manufacturers of Bevo were forced to find a replacement. They found another, from what we're able to determine, another ketone resin, but we don't know exactly um, what it is. And also at this point, I just want to say that a tachifier um, it's a, kind of a counterintuitive uh, material. It's a very brittle, low molecular weight resin, and you add this to the polymer in order to modify its properties. So essentially what it does is it acts like a solid solvent in the polymer and gets in between the polymer chains and adjusts the modulus of the material. And depending on the type of tachifier and the amount that you add, you can really tailor the properties uh, of the final product. So one of the first things we did is we looked at the photochemical stability of Biva 371 over a period of accelerated aging, or accelerated photoaging. Uh, looking at the IR spectra, we can note significant changes in the carbonyl region, which I'll highlight here. Um, so the area around 1700 wave numbers. Here we have um, the absorption of carbonyl groups, um, which are present in many different types of oxidative degradation species, like lactones, ketones, and carboxylic acids. So we can see that something is oxidizing, something is happening over uh, this accelerated aging period. We can also observe some yellowing, so the formation of chromophores. And it's kind of tricky to see here, but it gets a little bit more yellow as, um, as time goes on. So something is definitely happening, uh, happening to Biva as it ages. <clears throat> Now, a question that comes up often is what does accelerate, accelerated aging mean in terms of natural aging? And here are some of Jane Down's samples, which she very, very kindly gave to me in August. Uh, they're from her long-term study on adhesives at the Canadian Conservation Institute in Ottawa. Now, they were cast in 1987, and so they've been aging for approximately 26 years. And we can see that light aging has produced degradation. Oh, let me zoom in, sorry. We can see that the light aging has um, produced degradation that's uh, similar to our accelerated aging tests, uh, and that the dark aging is much less, but there's still beginning and um, some evidence of oxidation that's starting to happen. Also yellowing is much more evident in the light age samples as we expect, but there is also a little bit of yellowing going on, which is really hard to see in the, the dark age samples. So we looked at each of the components separately to try to isolate what was a troublemaker. All of them were pretty stable except for the ketone resin tachifier, which really stood out as being the least stable component. And this was ex expected based on Renee's previous research on low molecular weight resins. Now we know that ketone resins are susceptible to uh, Norrish type degradation reactions, which can lead to the formation of uh, oxygenated species and also chromophores. We can see the uptake of oxygen um, with size exclusion chromatography, where, I wish this worked, oh, there we go, where we have the broadening and increase in molecular weight. So oxygen is being picked up. Um, so oxidation can also lead to a shift in polarity of the material and consequently a shift in solubility, which can be an issue to conservators who have to reverse or remove Biva from a painting. So this might be a reason why some conservators have noticed issues regarding removability in their practice. 
Now we attempted to stabilize Biva using Tinubin 292, which is a hindered amine light stabilizer. However, you can see that we only obtained some degree of stabilization at the beginning, um, and in terms of long-term performance, it didn't really do well. So, he, uh, okay, the red and the blue curves are the uh, original and the new Biva formulation. The 371B is the new one. The one without the B is the original one. And then the green curve is the one that we tried to stabilize. And you can see that after, I don't know, 700 hours that it starts to, to oxidize and it does it really rapidly. So what this tells us is that in order to have a more stable formulation, we have to start to think about and to consider finding alternative uh, formulations. So finding a more stable alternative to the ketone resin or a resin that can be stabilized over time. Now, as I hinted at before, a large part of our effort um, while looking at Viva was trying to understand its physical properties. And we need this information in, in order to establish a baseline for the development and study of new materials. Any change in the formulation can have large p impacts on the physical properties. Um, and this step also uh, allowed us to develop a methodology for future testing of adhesives. So I guess you could say we also came up kind of with standardized methods for this. And uh, right now I'm just going to briefly summarize the results for the rheological tests and the probe tac tests. So understanding rheology is really important, uh, especially for, for the delivery of the adhesive, um, but also uh, the drying and the heat activation. So that as the solvent evaporates, the properties will start to change. And we can see with Biva 371 straight out of the can, so with uh, a concentration of about 40% uh, solids and 60% um, uh, solvent, that the older formulation has a lower modulus or an easier ability to flow under stress. And I just want to note that it's a log scale. Uh, so they might look similar, but they're actually quite different. Uh, so it has a much lower modulus compared to the newer formulation. Now in practice, the conservator will um, dilute Biva down to about 20 or 10% solids in, in solvent for the delivery purposes. Uh, and likely both formulations in terms of their ability to flow will come together. But the area we're most interested in um, terms for its TAC activation, so where a conservator will do the heat activation step, is above 90% solids and more likely closer to 89% or 100%. Uh, here we can see a, uh, a difference, oh, sorry, there we go. So here we can see a difference between the two formulations. Um, and the question we had was whether this is enough to cause a change, a change in TAC behavior. Uh, because, as you re recall, I mentioned that um, conservators had complained a little bit about the new formulation not sticking like the original one. So it's a slight difference, but maybe it is causing something um, with the TAC. So indeed, when we perform probe TAC tests on the sample, we do see differences. So the probe TAC test is essentially a measurement of the lobe required to separate the probe from the adhesive surface. So we have a probe that comes down. Um, at a constant rate, hits the surface at a specific load for a specific amount of time and then pulls up at a very, at a constant rate and you measure the load required to separate the two surfaces. And here I've done it over a temperature range uh, in order to understand the change in, in tack or the development of stickiness um, as you heat it up. Now for the original formulation, there appears to be a larger, more gradual tack window so the green and the blue curves, um, whereas the new formulation has a very narrow tack window, so the purple and the red ones. Uh, at 65, though, which is the activation temperature based on the product literature, they both appear to be very similar. So at 65, they appear or they look like they're meeting spec, but what's really interesting is the behavior leading up to 65 degrees Celsius. So in a practical point of view, we now have a viable explanation now as to why Biva doesn't stick like the, why new Biva doesn't stick like the old Biva. So if you think due to heat transfer limitations, uh, 
in short working times, the system may not reach a thermal equilibrium, uh, and you will have a temperature gradient going on. So I've chosen 55 degrees completely arbitrarily, but you think if you're actually practicing, you have your tacking iron, and then you have to go through air, and then probably through an isolating layer, and then through air, and then through your paint films, and finally get to your, your adhesive down below here. And if you're only doing this for 10 seconds, you might set up a gradient of some sort. Um, but what I really want to demonstrate here is that even choosing to 55, you know, you're 10 degrees below the recommended activation temperature. And in the old formulation, we have significant tack, whereas the new formulation, you really have to push the temperature closer to 65 degrees before you achieve the same amount of tack. Uh, now, I put it out to conservators last month when I did my exit seminar in Washington, and I offer it again to all the conservators in the audience that if you're having this sort of issue with the new Biva formulation, maybe you can try modifying, modifying the heating step in your treatment. Of course, within, re within reason, I don't want you to ruin a work of art, so it has to be safe for the work. Uh, and, just, and maybe you can just allow the system to come to equilibrium. It may just mean keeping the tacking iron or your heating tool on the surface for a little bit longer. I'm not sure. It's something to, to test. But if you do, please send feedback if you try it, uh, because um, I'm really interested to see if it helps. And the, inter the information is actually really useful for us uh, for the study. And everything is still very dynamic. So we really rely on the feedback of conservators so we know that we're moving in the right direction. Now, another point of discussion with conservators um, is which behavior between the two is more ideal, since both have their advantages and their disadvantages. So that's something else that if you have an opinion, I'd really like to hear. So to recap on things, uh, in the bioformulation, ketone, the ketone resin appears to be the least stable component. Uh, it can photooxidize rapidly, and it can lead to yellowing and a change in polarity, so a change in solubility. Um, oh, and also at this point, I should note that I really don't want the takeaway message to be that Biva is bad. I know there are many different opinions out there. Some people love it. Some people hate it. You know, some people use it because it sticks to everything. Some people avoid it like the plague. But um, I think as a lining adhesive, it works quite well. Uh, it has been successfully used for lining applications for the past th almost 40 years. And Berger really uh, studied it and studied its potential for that application. What I'm saying is that as a consolidant, I think the formulation uh, can benefit from a, a change, and I think it can be improved. Uh, and also, I think we could better design it for consolidation applications. Uh, also, um, as I showed on the previous slide, uh, there are differences in the tack activation windows between the, uh, the old and the new formulation, and conservators should just be aware of that uh, when they're using the material. And finally, um, we are able to develop new methods for investigating consolidating adhesives. And we're in the process of writing papers with our colleagues at uh, NIST. Hopefully, they'll be out in the next year so everyone can have access to uh, our TEF methods and, and just, uh, just the whole thinking behind it. Um, uh, also, I'll just say now that um, we have, we've almost wrapped up our studies with Biva. We're at the very end. And we're well on our way into looking at alternative formulations, but unfortunately, I don't have time uh, to talk about it right now, as I said at the start. But I'm going to be at the reception later tonight, and I'll be here all tomorrow. So if anyone is curious, uh, you can come and find me, and we can talk a little bit about what's going on right now with the project. And again, I just want to um, say that we're in our first steps. Still, um, we've just finished kind of looking at Biva, and we're moving ahead. And then it's a very large, ongoing international uh, project and collaboration. And without the help of all the different participants, really, I, I couldn't have done this on my own. <laughs> so I just like to thank many, many people for all their help. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'll do my best to answer questions. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Est-ce que vous avez donc des questions? Je regarde. Bon, vous pourrez euh, 
aussi, comme Rebecca nous l'a dit, la contacter après. Mais est-ce que des gens, des personnes ont des questions Non Si Question Là-bas de... I, I have a question. Thank you very much for this really fascinating project. And um, I'm an objects conservator, not a paintings conservator. So uh, my question relates to um, perhaps more porous uh, materials and paint layers than you might have been investigating for the purpose of, I'm guessing, just oil paintings. I wonder if you could comment at all about the usefulness of this particular study for more, for less highly bound uh, paint surfaces. It's a good question. Um, I guess, yeah, right now we're really focusing mostly on painted layers. Uh, we haven't necessarily done studies that would specifically look at putting it onto porous surfaces or friable surfaces, but the hope is that it could be applied to that. Uh, a lot of the work up to this point is understanding its chemical stability um, and also its physical properties. Um, but those are definitely something we want to start looking at, and we really need the help of conservators to get to uh, that point. But in theory, it's, it's on our mind. We know, we know that we have to do the work on that, and it's on the list of things to, to test it out on. I don't know if that answered your question, but... Notre précédente conférencière avait une question. Good presentation. I have a question concerning the um, rheology of your paints. You show the behavior of the modulus. And I was uh, thinking about why using the modulus and not checking the, the structuration of your uh, paints in, in order to ensure uh, covering on the, on the substrate. I don't know. Why using this specific test? Is it specification or you chose this? Okay, let's see if I understood the question. It's why did we use this specific rheological test? Um, it was a flowing test or dynamic test first? Uh, this, th it was really tricky to actually come up with this methodology because we couldn't use a traditional uh, setup because we had solvent evaporation happening and so our data was changing as we were doing the experiment. This is a simple Peltier plate uh, setup. So it's all kind of covered in its own little environment and we're doing frequency sweeps. So it's at a, a con it's at room temperature, frequency sweep. We pick a, we pick the frequency. The data is shown at, um, oh my gosh, it's like 0.15 hertz, which is what we thought was closest to the 10 second hold time we had on our tack measurements. So that's how we did it. But yeah, it was very. It took us a while to get to that point because we were very frustrated that we had solvent evaporating and we couldn't really do the experiment. Finally, we came up with Peltier plate. Thank you so much for that presentation. It's so useful to all of us in conservation in all different areas. And uh, you might have said this, and I just missed it. Who funded this? Was this funded entirely by NIST, or was it funded by the various organizations that, um, that you listed that have been involved in this research? And is this funding ongoing and sort of guaranteed for um, as you proceed through the different consolidants that you're going to be analyzing? Um. It's, every institution just came in on it on their own. Uh, some were funded, some were not. I had uh, funding through my fellowship, the Culpepper Foundation. Uh, NIST was doing it just because they thought it was a neat project. And we have, our, um, I guess MoMA was also in on it um, because it was interesting. I don't know if they had funding behind it. And we have a PhD student at the University of Torino who's uh, working on the project as well. But I, there's no overall funding that's driving this project forward. We're actually looking at the moment to keep it alive. Pas d'autres questions? Levez bien la main. Si, voilà. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, my question is, uh, will there be research on, as the next phase, is it planned to uh, find out uh, what uh, this adhesive behaves in different situations? 
because now what we have seen, uh, these are just, you know, purely chemical laboratory conditions. Uh, are there going to be further research upon uh, different situations this adhesive has, <coughs> excuse me, has been used before and how it looks like now? Yeah, I mean, in order, we have to kind of understand the material and everything is, when we're developing something new, we really have to figure out the methods in the lab in order to test it, but we're really hoping to get conservators involved in the project and have them using it in the field and handling it and trying it out, you know, diluting it down to something or just, you know, melting it in and just to give us feedback on it. That's one of the next steps right now. Hopefully in the near future we'll have conservators testing it out and testing the new formulations out.